Hugues Vian has a wife who's died after a marriage of 10 years. He's turned his house into a shrine. The house that he's occupying now is in Bruges, largely because Bruges has seemed to him to express all he wants to express about his own mourning, his own sense of loss, and he identifies Bruges with his dead wife. He's been in Bruges for five years. He, he lives a solitary existence. Um, just take, he, you know, he stays in his uh, quarters, his dwelling uh, most of the time, and leads a sort of idle, decadent life, but quite alone, just with his servant. And then he goes for these sort of evening walks around the town and follows the canals and the lanes and sort of becomes lost in a reverie. He wanders its streets, afraid that he's going to forget the image of his wife, clinging on, looking for all clues that may relate to her in what he finds in the townscape. One evening he bumps into a woman who looks exactly like his wife. He feels that she has uh, been resurrected and on a, a later occasion he follows this woman into a theatre where an opera is being uh, performed, an opera which in fact includes the notion of resurrection in it, albeit motivated by devilish designs. He learns that this woman, this dancer, is from Lille, that her name is Jane Scott. He creates a relationship with her, sees her as often as he can, and finally sets her up in a house in Bruges, much to the disgust of uh, the populace of Bruges. She's an actress. She's the opposite, really, of his, of his dead wife. He's looking for somebody... Well, he, he wants her to be like his dead wife, but really she isn't. And, um, and anyway, he has a relationship with her and becomes, um, they become involved. He uses her to try and relive uh, moments that he had uh, with his wife. He becomes more and more deeply entangled with her at the same time as she more and more lets down that image of his wife, seems to be a travesty of it. In the end, he feels that a kind of sacrilege has been committed and wants to break with her, but is tied to her simply through this resurgence of his sensuality. She, in fact, then has got her eye on his wealth. She invites herself round to watch the procession of the Holy Blood. She comes round, her entering the house compels Hugh's servant to leave. She then mocks and ridicules those elements connected with the dead wife that Hugh has, as it were, sanctified, most particularly this lock of hair that he's cut from her head. And then eventually it, all, it sort of spirals into a catastrophe and eventually he murders her um, quite sort of dramatically with the... Well, it's all around... Uh, it's quite f fetishistic because there's this plait of his his wife's hair that he uh, he strangle, ends up strangling Jane, the, the actress, with at the end. So, um, but that's basically what happens. You know, it's it's not a happy ending. Rodenbach is one of a group of writers. It's the f kind of first blossoming of Belgian literature. One must always remember, of course, that Belgium had become an independent state only in 1830, so that it's still a young nation looking for its voice. And if one were looking, I suppose, for sources of his morbidity, uh, then one might just recall, I think, that in 1866 he lost uh, a sister, Louise, at the age of 13. And in 1871, he lost another sister, Adele, at the age of 17, both from consumption. There's a strong, morbid streak for all his work. He was sort of obsessed with, with death, basically, uh, because, um, partly because he, had, he suffered a, a lot of um, bereavements in his family. It was a bit, a bit like Edvard Munch, actually, similar type of situation. 
so it became a sort of recurring theme and he channeled that through the through the landscape it is to all intents and purposes the first photo novel the first novel which is seriously um, illustrated with photographs not just one or two 35 photographs the majority of the photographs are photographs of the Bruges townscape so that particular features for example the belfry of the Grand Place of Bruges appears in 11 of the 35 photographs 19 of the photographs have reflections reflected water the canals only 12 of those 35 photographs have have people in them the photos in the original edition are scenes of they're, they're almost typical scenes of Bruges that you'd see on postcards they're fairly predictable in a sense and they just show different aspects of the town but they're, they're quite good <laughs> as photographs you know there's some nice uh, with because there's reflections there's quite a lot with reflections which is another factor in Bruges is the is these uh, this es this notion of estomp which is the uh, the reflections of the buildings in the canals which fascinated uh, Rodenbach as well and many others and people still today are all gazing into the canals looking at these incredible pure because they're so still you get these incredible reflections of the buildings going down the actual uh, experience of reading itself isn't really mapped out for you I mean it isn't mapped out for you in the sense of at what point do you stop and look at the photographs at what point do you uh, finish looking at them and turn the page uh, do you uh, look at them before you begin reading the page that is next to them or at the end um, and that they compel you also of course to uh, turn the book round in order to see them that these the two photographs that I have here have uh, compel, would, would compel me to turn the book on its side um, so that I've got to find a rhythm of reading text at the same time I've got to find a rhythm of looking at the photographs and of course the strange thing about the photographs is that they do not occur pre predictably yeah I mean because the photographs seem more like that those that would be included in a guide you know, they, don't, they don't really bear any res relationship to the actual story apart from the, the situation, the landscape. Yeah. So they're, they're not threatening in any way or, you know, they're just there. One never knows how to read a photograph. That they're all, somehow, even though they're as plain uh, as a pike staff, they're also encrypted. For the reader of the novel with a text, the process of uh, decipherment is the one that then becomes paramount, not just simply recognition, Oh, God, yes, that's another view of Bruges. Uh, I've seen several of those already. But what designs has it got on me? What's it trying to tell me? That it's not telling you, for instance, or not telling Jane. It would obviously be possible to have a completely passive attitude to these photographs. And you'd wonder why they were there. There is something lurid about the idea that this, this book concerns a resurrection. The resurrection of the wife in the figure of Jane, and at the same time, the resurrection of Hugues' sensuality. We've mentioned the, the centrality of this encounter with Jane in the Meyerbeer opera, um, and that we know perfectly well from that opera that the devil is uh, the person that you have business with when actually you're thinking about this kind of profane resurrection. People like Bart and so on have accustomed us to the photograph itself as a kind of tease between a past that has been and a present that we have in front of our eyes, a kind of sacrilege which says the dead aren't really dead. And that Jane, in that sense, is the force of the photograph. The photograph itself, one might say, is in danger of invading the way that Ug thinks about his wife. Ug is himself falling into a trap, which is the trap of resemblance. 
I mean, apparently it was the first book to have photographs in. Um, but it seems quite a sort of um, anodyne way of doing it. You know, I don't really know what the st what the purpose was behind it. It seems like they were just put in, you know, either on somebody's whim or something. That's how it feels to me. The preface itself gives every indication. One of the things he certainly wants to do with the photographs, he wants Bruges to be a principal protagonist. And he wants his readers to be in a position where they themselves have to come to terms with, with Bruges, as it were, in their own private way. This is actually quite strange because as one starts reading Bruges La Marte, the first image of this bridge over a canal, the chapter uh, uh, coincides with the, ch the first chapter, in which we're told, actually, that twilight is coming on, that the day is getting dark. What we have here is full daylight. The first chapter takes place in November. We have here what looks like the beginnings of spring growth on trees. So that if we want some examples of where the photographs apparently don't correspond to text, then they're thrown at us straight away. It has taken a great deal of time uh, for its true value to be appreciated. Uh, a lot of editions of um, uh, Bruges La Motte have not contained the photographs uh, and have therefore either doctored the preface or simply omitted it and treated it as though it were a novel without photographs. In terms, for example, of English translations, Terry Hale's 1993 edition for Atlas has 14 photographs in it. The most recent edition by Daedalus has 23 new photographs in it taken by Will Stone, but they're photographs that are, are in tune with uh, the ones that appear in the original edition. In the, new, in the English edition, I just suggested to the publisher, what, what do you think about having uh, you know, modern pictures of Bruges that are uh, evoked that, to show how little has really changed visually um, in that sense. And uh, but I, only because I'd already taken the photographs. I didn't take them for the book. I already had them. And I thought these would look really good in the book. And I was struck also how, how many similarities there were with the originals. And also I was struck by the fact that when I took those photographs, there's absolutely no human beings in any of them, apart from a woman on a bike, which, <laughs> when you think of how busy Bruges is today, is extraordinary. When I first went to Bruges, I'd, been, I'd had quite a long uh, period of illness, and I hadn't travelled anywhere. And uh, I went to Belgium, to Bruges. I can't really remember where I went first, but anyway, I, I was in Bruges. And I think I sort of um, was infected by it in some way. I do feel like like the main character. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so bereavement had brought an early autumn to his life, I think is the line, which I remember thinking, yeah, that sounds familiar. One of those pictures is actually a picture of the house that he used as the, the residence of the main character and actually isn't in the original. And I thought, how weird is that, that I, that I took a picture of the bloody building that he was in, yeah, without even realising, I don't think I'd read the book then. That sounds like I just made that up, but I think that is what happened. There were all these strange, fateful coincidences, which often happen and you just have to follow them. That's the house of Hugh that I took. Um, it's quite a nice one of the of the belfry. And that's the Jerusalem church. Yeah. There's a softness there. And also you get the sound of the bells. The distinctive carry on, the sound of these bells that sort of fall of course Rodenbach's always talking about the bells. And he, he uses all these different metaphors like cinders, ash, petals. And it does, they do feel like that, you know, in the atmosphere. <laughs>